Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the episode nine of the On the Brink show. And uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the continued fallout of the FTX collapse, particularly uh, taking a look at the um, filing of bankruptcy and some of the statements by uh, the gentleman who's overseeing that. Uh, with me again, I've got Jason Myers, lead architect of Audit Chain. So, Jason, let's let's go right into it. What are your thoughts based on what you've seen of the details of the filing? Uh, my thoughts for six years are the thoughts stated in the declaration of John J. Ray III in support of the Chapter Eleven petitions and first day pleadings. Right? Yeah. So if we get into this, <clears throat> there's the usual citations. I'm the CEO of the above captioned debtor. Uh, my first official act is to authorize the chapter 11 filing. Um, since his appointment, he's been working around the clock and he states that he's got over 40 years of legal and restructuring experience. And for those in the legacy financial world, you know who he is. Yeah. He's the one that administrated the Enron uh, bankruptcy, right? Yeah. And in item number five, it speaks volumes and sets the tone for the entire bankruptcy filing. Never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here, right? That, yeah. first, that first sentence in item number five is what we're gonna cover, right? Yeah. So first of all, for those who are not even familiar, who are in crypto, who may have been involved um, uh, and gotten snared in, in, the, in the FTX because you've had assets under their custody, um, we certainly feel for you. and. A corporate control is usually something that is written down in a procedures manual. Yeah. A corporate control is, for instance, how the company appropriates assets. Who plays a role in asset appropriation? Who plays a role in making disbursements? Who authorizes disbursements, right? Uh, who authorizes and, and oversees purchase orders, uh, invoicing. All these things are usually written down in a procedures manual. It literally can tell a blind man, if written in Braille, how to operate and execute the tasks of the company when it comes to appropriating assets, receiving assets, sending assets, selling or buying assets, right? Recording, yeah. recording accounting entries, journalization. There's a procedure uh, correlated to uh, the classification of each account in the chart of accounts, right? How you appropriate assets and how you operate the company is usually written down in a document, right? In the legacy financial world, uh, when these things are written down, they are usually discoverable. And during an enforcement action or an examination, let's be uh, uh, nice about this, during an audit, right? There's usually an examination of controls and procedures. And then there's an examination of what actually happened to determine whether or not you complied with your own controls and procedures. So are those documents typically part of a, like a due diligence process? Because I'm just thinking in the context of say, like the, v, like the number of VCs that they had who invested in them. Um, and like, would, would they have been looking at this handbook of looking for, would that be part of the due diligence? So uh, that's a great question, right? And what I'd like to do is now move to the investors, right? 
institutional investors also have written procedures and controls that govern how they run their fund, right? Mm -hmm. And when they do a due diligence, there's usually a set of principles that they follow. They should be written down, right? right? An investor should ask when they're allocating capital, uh, questions regarding how the company is operated. Who is in charge of what? Who is your CFO? Who is your controller, if any? How are those responsibilities divided, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is yes, investors have a framework for conducting due diligence. So can we imply that due diligence was not done or they were given false information, given the caliber of investors that invested, this was not their first rodeo. So it's either that, you know, if, if, indeed, the, if indeed there is a framework, then they must have been given some sort of documentation um, which was either false or they did not do, do they did not follow the framework and do the due diligence and ask those questions. Cause it would have been apparent there's no CFO, there are no controls and well, you know, things haven't been set up in a standard typical way. Let's examine what the public's perception of Sam Bankman Freed was first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The public turned this guy, the, the public deified him. Well, the media did first, don't you think? The public, the, 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 the public, their mind is shaped by the media. Yes. Okay? Right? Yeah. So yes. people looked at Sam Bankman Freed with this whole altruism. I'm just going to come out and say it. This guy was the Charles Manson of the crypto business. And his right hand, that little girl who ran Alameda, was yeah. his Sharon Tate. Yeah. That was Sharon Tate, Sam Bankman Freed was Charles Manson. And if nobody knows what that means, and a lot of people may not, read the book Helter Skelter, right? It's all about Charles Manson and his cadre of disciples. Right. Right? Sam Bankman Freed hypnotized the world. And he had disciples that supported that mission. So when you approach sophisticated investors and you yeah. ask the question, did they do due diligence? The answer, the most accurate answer I can give is I don't know. Yeah. Did they buy into Charles Manson's hypnotism? Did they sidestep the procedures that they usually take when they do due diligence? Did they sit at the end of the decision-making process and say, we can't get a handle on the operations, but this guy is, you know, he's a wonder boy. Let's take the risk. I mean, and usually that's, that's a, a greed driven thought. Like, I mean, the, he's a wonder, he was a wonder boy because what? Because he had made a lot of money because the technology was in is so innovative. Like what was it that I think made him that, such a wonder boy? I think um, his demeanor played a role in convincing those institutions. Hmm. His background played a role in those decisions because he was born I believe at Stanford University Hospital. His parents are yeah. uh, lawyers, right? Yeah. Um, and I think Kevin O'Leary said it best. It would seem, Kevin O'Leary said it, uh, he summed it up in, in, in three seconds. If I want to be compliant, I will hang out with FTX and his parents and I'll know I'll be compliant or something to that effect, right? Wow. Uh, and this is captured on video at a conference like a month and a half ago or two yeah. months ago. Yeah. So um, 
At the end of the day, these institutions allocate capital in thousands of different directions. They can't possibly do all the due diligence that is needed on every single one of those investments. However, I will say that the general public relies upon these institutional investors in a way, yeah. indirectly, yeah. to grow their capital. Because if I'm a pensioner and my pension fund allocated capital to, for instance, Tamasek, which is part of the single, uh, you know, they're a sovereign yeah. wealth fund, right? Uh, the Teachers Retirement Fund. Yeah, from uh, Canada. The there Canada. Were, there, there were. Uh, it, it's really incredible. Um, but this is not the first time we've heard about a failure to do due diligence by large institutions, right? Yeah. Which, what makes audit chain so important? We allow. First of all, we provide the tools for uh, any economic entity to articulate financial disclosure and we enable the investors or depositors to verify whether or not what they're articulating has integrity and reliability. That's what we do. It's been the focus of our work for years. So would Audit Chain have surfaced you know, there has been reporting around um, SBF and his uh, partner loaning themselves hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so in the context of sort of process controls and financial reporting standards, would audit chain have surfaced that, you know, there were these sort of inappropriate transactions? So... Uh, the answer is yes, but that happens long before. So when you, first of all, your audit committee and your remuneration committee would deal, of the board of directors would deal with something like that. And there would be written policies and procedures that include how you deal with related party transactions, mm -hmm. affiliated party transactions, right? There would be extra care in annotating these transactions if they were permitted. And those annotations are usually, they usually play a role in your financial disclosures because in your financial disclosures, you would enumerate for that period, a list of related party transactions that have occurred, such as on this date, 2021, uh, Sam Bankman Freed, or should I say the company loaned Sam Bankman freed $300 million. Uh, the loan carries an interest rate of blah and it matures on this date, right? Yeah. And then they would say, see risk factors. And you go to the risk factors section and it would say, um, although we believe that the credit, the company believes or the audit committee, and they might even include a summary of minutes that were stated during a committee meeting of the audit committee yeah. that dealt with this issue. It is believed that the credit worthiness of Sam Bankman Freed is good. However, in the event a failure to pay back the loan occurs, it may have a material negative effect on our liquidity and capital resources, right? Um, and there's another section in a disclosure document that talks exactly about liquidity, and that's the title. It's called Liquidity and Capital Resources, right? Mm -hmm. It talks about the cash on hand. It talks about their available credit lines. And it talks about their borrowings, right? And it also talks, in summary, about any borrowing activity that occurred in the period, right? That should corroborate with your statement of changes in stockholders' equity statement, which enumerates the effect on stockholders' equity that um, occurred in a line item called cash provided by financing activities. So a really good accountant will be able to tie all this together, right? But it right. all starts with written policies and procedures that govern how to deal with related party transactions and affiliated uh, relationships, right? 
Yeah. So do you, do you think because of the nature of the the cryptocurrency and blockchain space being fairly nascent um, and things moving so fast, do you think that this no like there are a lot of other companies that do not have the the level of corporate governance that they should, um, or do you think because not having a CFO, not having a board, not documenting, uh, having a way to document these sophisticated acquisitions, was that just like just a it's a negligence or is it no, like no, first of all, it's a cultural thing. Yeah. Five years ago, when I talked to people that did ICOs, people remember the ICO boom. Nobody did. Yeah. Nobody did accounting. Yeah. They didn't account. There were no accounting systems for crypto five years ago, right? There were scrapers for tax, chain scrapers for tax, right? Yeah. But if you talk to 95% of all of the things that flicker on a ticker right now that are crypto, and they were honest when you spoke to them, they will all tell you that we are, we have not yet, or are we are beginning to reconstruct our accounting past. Right. Right. Nice. So the answer is no. There is a cultural belief or a cultural unawareness of the need for these controls, which is kind of uh, strange because smart contracts and blockchains are capable of perfecting a lot of mechanized controls that ordinarily are manually performed inside of a legacy enterprise. Right. So. Well, you said you brought up the word culture. Do you think that inherent in sort of blockchain, it, you know, running a blockchain business, there is this culture of rejecting the anything that has to do with the traditional financial systems? Like, is there a, a naivete maybe? So or, let, me, let me read the second sentence in item number five of <laughs> the declaration, right? Okay. The first sentence was, never in my career have I seen such complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here, period. Yeah. Next sentence, from compromised systems integrity and faulty regulatory oversight abroad to the concentration of control in the hands of a very small group of inexperienced, unsophisticated, and potentially compromised individuals, this situation is unprecedented. In other words, the word unprecedented means there is no precedent. It has not happened before as yeah. observed by this individual. He has yeah. not observed such a case. But he has not been, this is his first like blockchain cryptocurrency, like needs to sort of dive into that space. My point is that there's probably a bunch of FTXs out there. They and, are mostly yes. FTXs out there. There are mostly FTXs out there. Let me put it another way. Very few implement the type of controls that the very next section in his declaration covers. One, implementation of controls, which is one of his five core objectives as the interim CEO. The implementation of accounting, audit, cash management, cybersecurity, human resources, risk management, data protection, and other systems that did not exist or did not exist to an appropriate degree prior to my appointment. This is his statement. Right. And that's his objective, number one, or uh, 6A in the declaration. B, asset, asset protection and recovery. The location and security of property of the estate, a substantial portion of which may be missing or stolen. C, transparency and investigation. 
The pending, comprehensive, transparent, and deliberate investigation into claims against Mr. Samuel Bankman Freed, the other co founders of the debtors, which is FTX, and third parties, in coordination with regulatory stakeholders in the United States and around the world. D, efficiency and coordination, cooperation and coordination with insolvency proceedings of subsidiary companies in other jurisdiction, and E, maximization of value, the maximization of value for all stakeholders through the eventual reorganization or sale of the debtor's complex array of business investments and digital and physical property. Yeah, I mean, the things that he states there are just part of doing, like the things that we're missing are part of doing good business. When I you just... set up a corporation, you are supposed to choose an accounting system, designate the controls around that accounting system, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Choose banks, open bank accounts, board of directors takes minutes of which bank they're gonna open an account with. They're gonna list the number of accounts, they're going to list the account numbers, what each account is used for. The bare minimum, every company has an operating account, a payroll account, and an expense account, right? And the procedures yeah. should delineate how each of those accounts need to be treated and the warning that only transactions associated with specific purposes ought to, be, uh, uh, ought to occur in each of those accounts, right? Yeah, I think they skipped that step in FTX. They did. But do you think that was a part of the anti-corporate culture that a segment of the crypto space has? It's like it's almost like people just need to realize, like, we can we can we can move blockchain technology forward and still do good business and be good stewards of customer funds and be good to customers without being seen as sort of corporate sellouts like it, it feels like there is this segment that that believes that it's to, to to be in the blockchain space is a rejection of every everything sort of that's involved with being corporate you know what i mean so like you 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 said it was a cultural problem. It it's a cultural like problem yeah. because when blockchain first, the first chain of blocks was covered in papers referenced yeah. in the Bitcoin white paper by cryptographers, right? What's a cryptographer? Yeah. A cryptographer studies and practices the science of protecting information. Mm -hmm right? And governing access to that information, right. right? So there is a movement, was a movement, I, they still exist, but I'm almost positive that these, this group did not increase in size. There was an original movement called the cypherpunk movement. Yeah. They believed in privacy, right? They were advocates for privacy and they were cryptographers, right? So, and I will bet you that they're sitting, looking at this, shaking their head in disbelief that how their industry could have, you know, how their science could have been exploited for yeah. such various purposes, right? Um, but as time moved on and Bitcoin was launched and then Ethereum was launched, that cypherpunk movement morphed into something else. Right. And that culture um, didn't have corporate controls in mind, not because they were nefarious about it. It just wasn't something that was within their scope, their personality, their culture. They were about protecting information. They may have been hired by corporations to protect information or to yeah. teach them how to protect information. The whole cybersecurity movement, right? You have good actors and bad actors and the bad actors won out in, in, in this world, on this planet, the bad actors prevailed, right? Yeah. So um, yes, there is a culture, but it, it's like anything else. If you, for instance, read the Bible, after 2,000 years, 
it has this little rascals effect where they tell two friends, they tell two friends. And by the time it gets to where it's going, there's a complete misinterpretation of the original text. Right. Right. And in the cryptocurrency in, uh, you know, the crypto space, there's been a complete misinterpretation of the intent, the complete misinterpretation of the culture and the complete misuse of the science. Yeah. And in FTX's case, it was a TradFi scam using cryptography, assets that were the, supposed to be the subject of cryptography as the subject, right? Right, right. Make no mistake, this is a combination of Lehman Brothers and Ber Bernie Madoff, or Bear Stearns and Bernie Madoff. Bear Stearns had written policies, controls, and procedures. They were a public company. So was Lehman Brothers. FTX was not. And that's the heart of what John J. Ray's statements are. In that first item, number five. Unbelievable. So it's not too late for, for you know, those other folks that might find themselves um, intentionally or unintentionally, or whether it was it's naive um, in a place where they don't have back records. But going forward, you know, what can they do with audit chain? You know, how can they get, you know, started at least get themselves squared up? Well, in plain English, they can implement into the protocol in order to make transparent. Step number one, two, raise the integrity of financial disclosure information, and three, the reliability of that information, and four, allow the community of stakeholders to independently verify the integrity and reliability of that information. And I have to say one thing before we close, because there's all this talk of proof of reserves. Proof of reserves is worthless without a full articulation in US GAAP or IFRS of all four financial statements with notes under an audit by a plurality of auditors, not one. And that has been our work since we started this project. I want to repeat myself, proof of reserves is worthless, worthless. It needs context. That also, by the way, is not an audit. Yeah. It is an agreed upon procedure. Uh, yeah, my right? understanding. The agreed, yeah. the agreed upon procedure is an agreement between the subject under that procedure and the one performing that procedure. It is very limited in scope. There are no declaratory statements by the auditor performing the procedure. The balance on this date was X. The balance of this segment was Y. That's it. But yeah. without corporate liabilities, operating liabilities, to give you context, proof of reserves is worthless. I'm going to repeat myself. Yes. Proof of reserves <laughs> is worthless. And it seems like, I want to get your thoughts on this, because it seems like, to your point, that there has been implied a bit of collusion between some of these um, exchanges and actually sending each other blocks of, of crypto to show that they have some reserves when they're actually showing the same set of reserves. So I want to plug for PwC, and under that uh, leadership of A. Michael Smith, there was a um, proof of key, key pair validation, mm -hmm. where PwC attempted to prove that control of the address containing the balance of crypto rested in the hands of the affiliated people, the C-suite people designated with the responsibility for unlocking that address, right? right. Right. So, yes, there has been stories that there's been large blocks of crypto moving back and forth between exchanges, right? Anybody, I can send 300 million worth of Bitcoin to you 
you yeah. want to exchange and you can declare that that's part of your balance sheet. Exactly. And then when that period of declaration is over, you send it, send back. it back. Easy as pie. You can do that in five minutes or however many block confirmations it takes. So it needs a full, so I think your point is there is a full set of standards and compliance and regulations based on your jurisdiction that companies need to, it's, it's a full audit essentially. That yeah, it's a full not audit. Just, it's not only a full audit, there is a division of responsibility between auditors to audit different segments of the enterprise, right? right. Around right. custody environments, right? Security and custody, right? Financial, right. right? The segregation of duties of custody and exchange in a crypto exchange because traditional exchanges do not custody. There is not a traditional exchange on the planet that holds custody of funds, both clearing trades, settling trades, and custody of cu customer funds occurs away from the exchange, not under the same roof, right? Does that um, tie into some of the conversation that's there's been around Gemini and Genesis? Um, I can't speak for them. Uh, I something tells me um, that they have some sort of a semblance of controls and procedures that they might follow. Okay. Um, it was um, Genesis, I believe, got trapped inside of FTX to the extent of $175 million. I believe there was an announcement by DCG, its parent, mm -hmm. that it would allocate 140 million, not 175. Um, and now it, the word on the street is they're looking to raise a billion, Genesis, right? I see. So um, look, in closing, I wanna say what happened from, from the summer, three hours capital, Celsius, Voyager, and Block, Block five. was a TradFi series of actions that ultimately led up to now FTX. I'm not saying FTX and them were related, but uh, they're not unrelated because FTX made a series of related party transactions to backstop some of these entities, right? And without any controls whatsoever, citing the declaration, uh, this was inevitable. This was inevitable, right? It was just a time bomb waiting to blow up and it blew up. And now hopefully people will understand what we've been trying to communicate, right? Yeah. And I've been getting phone calls from people who I've talked to a year ago, two years ago, no hello, no how you doing? It's just, I'm so sorry. Now I totally, I didn't get it before, but I totally get it now. Yeah. Right? Well, the time has come for Audit Chain. Um, on that note, thank you for joining us again. We're always uh, happy to hear your comments and your thoughts. Uh, check us out at auditchain.finance. And uh, thank you for listening.